well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. This ain't no walk in the park, this ain't no planet of no apes. I am Eric, this is Double Feature, and I'm joined today by Michael Kester. Yep, today we're going to do Planet of the Apes and Colossus, the Forbin Project. I guess it's uh, classic sci-fi day. We're going to do one well-known and one that I'm going to say is not well enough goddamn known. I agree with you fully. (laughs) In that order, too, we're going to do Planet of the Apes first. If you haven't seen it or somehow don't know how it ends, you can skip over that, go to Colossus, the Forbin Project. If you haven't seen Colossus, actually see that. I realize no one listening has yep. seen it, but see it. Uh, we're going to spoil both, so use those chapters to skip around. And fuck it, man. Let's just start with Planet of the Apes. All right. Fantastic. So we're talking about 1968 here, and mm-hmm. I have an answer to the age-old question we haven't hit on nearly enough on the show. Is Charlton Heston white? Um, we already covered that in a previous episode. Okay. No, the question was, what the fuck does a producer do? Okay. And here, not only is it uh, the producer important, but I would say a commendable job Without the producer here, we're talking about an old school studio film, Planet of the Apes probably wouldn't have gotten made. It's uh, Arthur Jacobs who really put the whole thing together. And so the guy did uh, What a Way to Go, the original Dr. Doolittle before okay. Eddie Murphy showed up. Right. Um, but he wanted to do this Planet of the Apes movie. This was really his baby and no one would buy it. So before they had a director, maybe even before they had writers, I don't remember what phase it was. They decided we need a star to sell this. And mm-hmm. by they, I really just mean Arthur Jacobs. Okay. Decided I got to get a star in order to pitch this to, to studios or get somebody to agree to this. Yep. So he signs on Charlton Heston. Okay. So before he gets they, Moses to do the movie. Right. Before they really have much of anything. I think um, he was previously credited when we did Michael Moore Hates America. I think Penn Jillette talked about him as Jesus or Moses or something. Uh-huh. And so we'd done the Ten Commandments. And he'd done uh, Ben-Hur. He played all these epic characters. Mm-hmm. And this is a movie, it's a lot different. He gets drugged through the fucking dirt. Yeah. I mean, he is just, ho- he's in cages. He can't talk. But there's a lot of, there's still a lot of kind of biblical overtones to the whole sure, thing. He sure. still plays a scripturesque character. Yeah. Maybe yeah. A, he's not departing too much from the hero. An Old Testament motherfucker, if you right. will. <laughs> right. He's just fucking hopeless. Old Testament down to the selfish, I'm going to take my woman and leave, and the rest of humanity, you're all fucked over here. Yeah, that's very Old Testament of him. The guy even got his ass kicked while uh, while shooting the thing. I think he was sick during the scene, the infamous Damn Dirty Apes scene. Damn Dirty Apes. Which is great for two reasons. One, that he sounds really hoarse and awful, like I do every other episode of the show. Mm -hmm. And the other being that after his throat was fucked up, in the movie and he hasn't talked for a while he does sound a a little bit more hoarse but oh charlton heston what a trooper um to get back to arthur jacobs for a second all right he gets charlton heston on so we have some kind of collaboration now we have a project uh looming here in creation a title and a star yeah well and even at that point and you know i think they had a script right they had the rod uh serling script and they had to convince the execs at this point that all right, maybe we'll green light this thing. It's got Charlton Heston, but the makeup. Is it going to be corny? Are people going to laugh at it? People in monkey suits don't work out. So they had to do this $5,000 screen test, which still exists. You can find it probably on the DVD. We watched a Netflix streaming mm-hmm. thing of it, but you can probably find it on YouTube or on the DVD. And um, it's just a quick screen test to show we can do some sort of you know, hybrid ape makeup, monkey yeah. face. Yeah, where people could still emote, you could still believe that it's actors because it's not just one ape thing that we're dealing with. Every character in the whole fucking movie, I mean, it rides on the fact that we're not going to be snickering the entire time. So as far as I know, even up to that point, there's still no director. But uh, I mentioned Rod Serling. So you know Rod Serling. Oh, stuff. I know Rod Serling intimately. All I um, I would love to hear more about that. We maybe, skip and fish. Maybe after the show. Uh, the Twilight Zone is really yeah. all I know about Rod Serling. And that he was discharged from the army in the mid-60s or something. He wrote radio dramas and was a anti-war activist and into politics and stuff. But what other stuff is he? Who is this guy? He Well, I mean, really, Rod Serling is the... Twilight Zone guy. He's Mm -hmm. the guy who in the original Twilight Zone series with the hair and the absolutely iconic face 
of mystery and intrigue. So he was actually in the series. He's the narrator in every single episode. Oh, wow, I had no episode. idea. Sure. Twilight Zone's one of those things I keep telling myself I'm going to watch yeah. that, but I need to give it the time it probably deserves right. to sit down and see every fucking episode. Twilight Zone is, is very much kind of where the the big shocking twist moment came from sure in the film four rooms which we haven't actually covered yet i believe we've covered this scene right before, exactly not the film um they discuss a twilight zone episode and and even in that film every every little bit of the twilight zone is about defying what the audience is originally sure. expecting which is why it makes absolute sense that Rod Serling is behind Planet of the Apes. Well, so he did the original, uh, I guess, screenplay, original script for it. Sure. And then Mike Wilson was the one who did the rewrite. Not Mike Wilson from... <laughs> from Michael Moore Hates America. No, different Mike Wilson. Yeah, so he comes in and he basically scales down. This movie was apparently supposed to be a lot more futuristic. Uh, crazy sci-fi stuff and monkeys and helicopter. They were supposed to have an advanced civilization. Which kind of gives away the ending just a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I mean, I haven't read that original draft. I don't even know if that's available anywhere mm-hmm. to read. I'm sure he did a good job of covering his tracks with it. Sure. But um, it's, you know, it's hard to say without having seen that. And then I've also read that Mike Wilson was responsible for adding some of the politics to it. Uh-huh. Although I would have assumed that was a Rod Serling thing. But again, without having seen that original draft, who's to really say on that? couple other names while we're just rounding the the production sounds like a good time so roddy mcdowell that's another one that's a name he plays cornelius in the film awesome that's actually exactly where i wanted to go that was a part supposed to be uh played by edward g robinson okay who pulled out of the movie kind of got cold feet after he saw what the makeup job entails so he was in that original uh thing i was talking about that little screen test John Chambers did the prosthetics and makeup of the end film, Mm -hmm. which was different from the $5,000 screen test they did. He's a guy, I mean, he did The Monsters, The Outer Limits, uh, the original Mission Impossible. He was a guy who did Spock's ears on the original Star Trek show. That's that's a serious cred right there. Right, certainly. And he's also been accused of creating the Bigfoot suit for the infamous, uh, I think it's uh, Patterson-Gimlin film. The uh-huh. one you, you always see of the Bigfoot going through the woods, swinging his arms around. Hanging out. Right. And I don't think he was ever, um, I think he actually disputed those claims. But a lot of people credit him for that, probably because he was such a, a prominent name mm-hmm. in effects for the time. So the actual makeup job is about three to six hours. Okay. I think they got it down to about three when they finally sort of got the hang of it. But man, I'd, I remember uh, hearing Rebecca Romaine complain about being mystique yeah, in the, in the um, X-Men films, exactly. the Brian Singer X-Men. Yeah. in the first two and yeah. in the third one as well. And she was talking about the great lengths they had to go through to strip her down and paint all of this stuff on her mm-hmm. and how ridiculous that makeup job was. And you see a lot of people drop out of these kind of superhero or special effects things. They do a couple of these and they say, you know what? I never want to be under that much makeup right. ever again. That wasn't just a scare to Robinson though. I mean, it was a scare to the studio because They had this mounting budget that would just keep inflating. So that was another thing that put off the production is they were now going, all right, we got the stars. We got a script. We have all this stuff. The special effects are great. We have some monkeys finally in this fucking Planet of the Apes movie. But uh, it looks like it's going to cost a lot of money. So they agreed on $5 million and they said, fuck it. And they started filming. And they actually came in on budget, which is pretty amazing. So one last name in setting this up. And that is Jerry Goldsmith. Mm-hmm. Jerry Goldsmith did the uh, the score. He did, uh, if we want to get back to some Star Trek roots here, he did five of the Star Trek films. Okay. And then a bunch of other stuff. I mean, Chinatown, Poltergeist. Um, trying to think if there's anything on the show. Uh, Alien. All right. Did the Ridley Scott Alien movie, uh, Rambo 1, 2, and 3, and Total Recall. Wow. Has kind of showed up quite a bit uh, on the show before and just never gotten a chance to talk about him. Mm-hmm. But this was really... I mean, the thing was kind of experimental for the time. It was uh, the Planet of the Apes score, I mean. It had these kind of bizarre instruments, uh, metal pieces. There's that uh, ram's horn that's Mm -hmm. heard all the time, which kind of sounds like maybe it's an actual sound effect sometimes rather than an instrument. You hear it early on in the the scene where the apes first ride in on on horses. When the apes ride in on horseback and start shooting all the people eating their corn. A score that's then sampled and used in an excellent Snake River conspiracy song called Breed. But I I find it funny that in this movie, it hits you over the head with the humans are like the apes, but Mm -hmm. the apes are like the humans and the horses are, well, they're they're still horses. Right. So we come up against those kind of sci-fi allegories. And this is always weird territory for me. I'm curious if you feel the same way. Mm -hmm. 
Because sci-fi movies, uh, for me, they either fall into Camp A or Camp B, and I can never even tell which one it is. It makes them hard to talk about on this show without just attacking stuff at surface all the time. It's, uh, it's either super cheesy and obvious. Mm-hmm. You know, we're with the things like the monkeys. I mean, that's a very surface layer of Planet of the Apes. Right. That's not really what they're getting at. But to say that if this were a movie, say we're a movie about how we treat animals. Right. Then to have well, the it animals. Is to a, I think it is to a degree, but sure. not very much. Well, like I said, surface. Yeah. Right. Just to say, hey, Charlton Heston is in a cage. How does he like it? Mm-hmm. Human see, human do, that kind of shit. Free the right? cancer rats. It's so fucking obvious. But then we also have the opposite end where sometimes sci-fi movies are completely overinterpreted mm-hmm. and people look into them way too much because they have, I mean, they have such a thick wall of padding around the message. There's so much to get lost in trying to figure out, you know, in the things that separate our reality from their reality, we can read so much into it as far as an allegory, as if each part of it could be interpreted as do you ever run it? I mean, uh, let's look at something we did on the show. Uh, fifth Element, right? Yeah. You could talk about a lot of things in the fifth, and it's a pretty straight up action mm-hmm. sci-fi thing, but you could even just look at the world or yeah. the fashion right? and say they're trying to say something about how we've progressed into the future. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of what Fifth Element is, is about everything in excess and how come the future things that you know may seem a little bit out there now are just, that's just going to be normal. People are going to dress in tape. And everybody's just going to be even weirder than they are now. Okay, but you see what I'm saying? All no, right, yeah. we've, we've no, come I, up I'm, against I'm, this. I'm giving you an example. Yeah. It's totally not what the movie's about <laughs> at all. So you have to wonder, at some point, did anyone think of that? Did the film's ultimate creator, you know, we love these films made by one person. We can judge that. Fifth Element is not made by one person. It's made by lots of people. It's very true. Especially when we got into, or rather didn't get into the fashion in that mm-hmm. movie. There's an entire department, someone in that department, perhaps the head of the art design or the fashion, said, let's dress everybody hyper futuristic Mm -hmm. and in excess because they had an idea about people in the future, they live in excess. Maybe the script writer or the director didn't feel that way. Right. So it's hard to say, does that then become part of the message of a film or is it just one insane guy in the crew who felt that way? And you find that in Planet of the Apes in some of the deeper messages that some people thought they were really constructing a movie that had these political overtones or religious overtones. And some people had no fucking clue. You know, I think it got past a lot more people back then than it does now. Now we watch it and we we look at stuff like the Sacred Scrolls. I mean, this is, uh, you know, you just saw this thing with me. I mean, what what's your takeaway from Sacred Scrolls? I think the Sacred Scrolls are really just kind of, uh, it, it goes to show what, it's the Bible, right? Sure. It's a lot of all that whole thing. And it's, it's about how it's the rules. It's how things are legislated. And furthermore, it goes to put a staple in history started 1200 years ago. Right. And that's kind of the biggest notion i mean it they bring it out a bunch of times to prove this and disprove that and say that charlton heston is the chosen devil boy yeah but it really goes to prove that society started 1200 years ago and that's a fact which when we know charlton heston has been around for 2000 years he certainly has so uh, you know it's interesting to talk about him being in the ten commandments right a movie that's celebrating the uh silly mythos of the bible And then to appear in something like this that seemingly mocks the Bible, another fucking huge part of his career that seemingly mocks the Bible. We also get all this stuff about science, you know, directly challenging religion, uh, a fact that they deny, even when they're face to face with the evidence, especially Dr. Zayas. Mm -hmm. We have the stuff about heresy and about ancient taboos and, you know, the chosen people. And it's highly likely that that's a mockery of the Bible or of organized religion. Sure. But it's hard to pin that down specifically. And I mean, as human beings, we have this wonderful, awful fucking ability to compartmentalize things Mm -hmm. so that someone can look at this and they can laugh at the creation myth of the apes. Uh Uh-huh. And then they can turn right around and say that the belief that Heston's character has, you know, talking about God earlier in the movie or thinking there must be something in the universe right. greater than him, they don't question that at all. Well, it's almost like they're laughing at, like, silly monkeys, God's not a monkey. Right, right. That's what they're saying. Right, kind know? of missing the point of it there. Yeah, they're laughing They're laughing at the apes for being dumb enough to think God looks like a monkey. 
it's similar to the way people mock Scientology, but don't realize that Christianity is just as fucking foolish. Yeah. That it has ghosts and zombie messiah and talking snakes. It makes it just as little sense. But you compartmentalize. That religion is silly. How could you believe those things? My religion is the one truth. Mm -hmm. So I could see where that could be a way that people don't read into things in movies as well. Mm -hmm. They just skip over those pieces that might be challenging to them. Or they make them uncomfortable. Yeah. Or they consider that those aren't things that challenge them personally and they accept them. Where, like you said, making fun of the uh, God couldn't be an ape. You have a little bit of class warfare stuff in here, too, um, which is really direct when they get to the trial scene. Some mm-hmm. apes are more equal than others. Sure. Well, I mean, it's it's broken down very obviously by color. Yeah, right. You have right. orangutans, which are judges and the higher ups and gorillas, mm-hmm. which are they just punch people. That's all they did. Right. In this movie. They punched people and chimpanzees, which are the smarter but more downtrodden class of uh, the planet of the apes, which is Earth. That might say something about the time the movie was made, but I think that sort of stuff, I mean, it it applies throughout time. Mm -hmm. You have stuff as recent as Don't Ask, Don't Tell, or you could go as far back in in the United States anyways as, you know, the hypocrisy of the forefathers saying all men are created equal, Uh and then they went home to their slaves. Right. Well, uh, how about the three-fifths compromise? (laughs) We're pretty much riddled throughout our history with uh, that kind of social inequality. So that's one of those, those... themes in sci-fi movies that you can divorce yourself enough from the time that it was made or the time that it takes place rather Mm -hmm. planet of the apes takes place you know in the far distant future so we're not pointing out a specific time we're not saying in vietnam there wasn't very good equality we're just saying this is generally a point of conflict throughout history and will unfortunately continue to be for probably quite some time so as the movie's winding down, they really make a point of hammering in that it's a different planet. Yeah, they start mentioning different planet at the end of every other sentence. Well, and the reason they do that is because they're talking about the religion. The sure. religion and the society of that planet. Uh-huh. And so you don't suspect, hey, why are we talking about being on a different planet all the time? And then all of a sudden, there's the turn. There's the right. classic Planet of the Apes turn. The first time I saw it was uh, with my girlfriend at the music box, and... Somehow she was not aware of how the movie ends. So I actually got to see the reaction of a person who was shocked by the infamous wow. ending. One of the most famous movie endings of all time. Mm-hmm. I, I was, mean, this and Citizen Kane. In right? all, in all <laughs> honesty, I was spoiled by The Simpsons. I was surprised by how perfect that ending was delivered. 70 sci-fi, man. They oh, just yeah. get the That's endings right. I mean, you get this reaction out of him. It shows you his face and just enough to get the crown of the mm-hmm. Statue of Liberty. The torch. Which I can't, yeah, I can't tell if you would know what that is. If, I mean, she didn't know if right. that, you know, if that's our, there's our one data point yep. on that. But it pans out to show the statue after you get his reaction, after he delivers his final lines, talking about you blew it all up, which kind of gives the answer to the lingering question in the whole movie of where did civilization go mm-hmm. if this was in fact Earth? And without a lot of people the first time through maybe even asking that question, he's giving an answer. One that at the time might not make sense until the second time you go through the movie now knowing it's Earth and then thinking to yourself, well, where'd all the people go? Mm -hmm. So when it turns around and shows the Statue of Liberty, you have just enough time to go, hey, why do the apes have a Statue of Liberty? Wait a second, this is Earth. And then the camera lingers there just a little bit longer and you sort of scoot to the edge of your seat and you're waiting for... Some kind of, I don't know, anything. Him to identify with you as an audience. Flashbacks to the The, end of society. Right, the reaction, any kind of further information, and it just fades out. It leaves the fucking ocean sound, the Mm -hmm. empty, desolate ocean, and you just get the credits. 70s movies do not give a fuck about you at the end. No, that's absolutely true. In fact, we have another one. Colossus the Forbin Project from 1970. 1970. So we are two years past the advent of the planet of the apes probably well into the sequels of the planet of the apes by now i should point out that being made in 1968 i'm just gonna consider planet of the apes a 70s film right? absolutely Nobody justifiable but we already fucking made the chapter mark it's colossus the forbin project no going back and correcting that now right so the setup plays on the best kept secret myth mm-hmm. this uh big secret the government doesn't want you to know whether it's an alien cover-up or the inner workings of the cia or that The president actually sits down and gets handed a pamphlet of secret knowledge about what's really going on in the Mm -hmm. universe. You know, the idea here is that there's actually a computer that's been keeping us safe. 
Sure. That we haven't yet revealed to the public. Well, no, he reveals it to the public right at the beginning of the film. Well, they've been working on this thing, mm-hmm. and the public just doesn't know about That's it true. yet. So as of the point where the movie starts, we still have that giant government secret mm-hmm. that they've been working on. And so it's an interesting point that they bring us in the film, because it's a perfect excuse. I mean, the public unveiling is a blatant setup for the film. Mm-hmm. But that excuse is justified. You have to tell the public about it. As the audience, we're members of the public. We happen to come in at the beginning of the right. meeting, and now we're finding out along with them. We don't have to deal with any further time for that setup because we see what's going on right, right. away. Absolutely. And I love the the statement they use. The president uses, we're going to live in the shade, but not the shadow of Colossus. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to be defended by it. It's going to be a fucking picnic for yeah. us. So the name of the guy who made Colossus is right. Forbin, thusly Forbin. the Forbin Project. Right. Once again, reassuring you at the end of the film that it's his fucking fault, his that fault. asshole. And uh, the building that they house Colossus in is pretty goddamn amazing. It's a mountain. It's um. So what is that? The actual center looks like something from uh, the first Hellboy movie. Yeah, I think, it, I think it actually is the same building. Is it I the mean, Bureau of Paranormal Research thing? Yeah, Colossus and Hellboy next door neighbors, you know, fruitcake on Christmas kind of thing. The actual place Colossus is kind of housed, the, the bunker in the side of the mountain, I think that's just the fallout shelter from Terminator 3. It's probably That's what we're dealing with. Absolutely, there. just as likely. Speaking of which, uh, Skynet had to be said once yeah, during the show. You said it. So, However, in Colossus, mm-hmm. when we get the uh, the view of the mountain, the mountain tomb where the Colossus machine is being kept, uh, instead of "Ooh, scary, be afraid of Skynet," you get "Oh, look how much this this precipice has grown as a tourist attraction." Right, right. First time you get it, there's a car a couple looking. Oh, sure. is that the is that where Colossus? Last time you see it, it's a there's a amusement park, media people circus with cotton is the term candy. For that. Everybody's yeah. having a really good time, or maybe literal circus if there's cotton candy. So let's just start listing off the bullet points of why Colossus is the like greatest goddamn thing of all time. Should we start with the best part? The the place I want to start is finite absolutes. Okay, the fact that this movie does not talk down to you mm-hmm. at all. In fact, it talks to me at a higher reading level than I'm probably capable yeah. of. Um, you know, we're told the, that line about finite absolutes. We're told the, um, the president's told that it's doing proofs or verifying, what is it, complex principles of physics or something? Sure. Well, what ends up happening is Colossus goes so much and so far beyond human discovery that it eventually verifies what it, the... It eventually verifies the expanding universe theory right. and discovers a new law of gravitation yeah. and introduces I mean, crazy an insane absolutely stuff. new mathematical principles. Yeah. That's yeah. That, I mean, it, it goes far and away beyond humanity and that's within moments of starting up. And so with the exception of the dummy warhead in general, mm-hmm. who is the only person in the movie who ever talks down, the guy who's saying, Hey, that's the dummy warhead. We're now taking the dummy warhead out of the box. We're going to go ahead and insert it in there and exchange it for the real Warhead, because it's the dummy Warhead, so that way the Warhead won't go off. With the exception of that guy, the audience is always talked to, like, they are on a primer level of mathematics. Mm-hmm. You remember the good old primer episode? I don't even remember at this point what we did Oh, you mean with. primer the movie, not primer the four-year-old. Primer the four-year-old? Like a primer level. Oh, right, yeah. No, I meant primer the movie. I'm trying to remember what we did primer with. Doesn't fucking matter. It was year one or year two. Primer was a uh, a movie that definitely didn't talk down to its audience, and if I remember correctly, made by Shane Crith, who was a mathematician. Fucking awesome, go see Primer. But Colossus is actually giving us these um, the very mathematical things it's talking about. It's not just saying we have advanced calculus. That's where it starts, is advanced calculus. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the entry level, and then we move up from there. And you have to congratulate a movie that just talks to its audience as if it understands maybe even when an audience doesn't deserve it talks to us as if you know at at the end result we don't need to know what principles of physics or mathematics it's talking about yeah we just know it's doing stuff way beyond our own level yep and that's really the only objective of the scene so i don't know why more movies don't do that it's because it's now uh 2011 and not 1970 (laughs) Could you imagine, you know, I mean, the computer doesn't even have a voice, not till the very end. Not and even till we then, start it's barely that. a voice. It's a, it's a fucking computer voice. It sounds like a Tesla coil. Oh my God. It does. It does. It just doesn't. Ah, oh, fuck. It's, 
it's not even 2001 a space odyssey level mm-hmm. which i pronounce as 2001 not 2001 because that's how you pronounce 2001 and i'm not going to disagree with it but there we have a, a soothing voice a real person's voice in a more modern movie we probably have a fucking british voice because mm-hmm. that's just what happens here it's a mean uncaring violent fucking aggressive computer voice it's just it's so unnerving you're glad when they shut the computer yeah, voice off right or when the computer chooses not to use the voice you know, the whole time a lazy audience might be saying, just make the computer talk. Yeah. We want to hear the computer talk. I'm tired of reading. I'm not here to see a foreign movie. Yeah, this isn't a Russian sci-fi movie uh-huh. because we're afraid to see those. But the computer starts talking and then it's just we're begging to shut it off. Mm-hmm. It's so mean to it. And the computer is such a dick in this movie. The computer is 100% based on necessity and there is no outside frills to what's going on. The computer is to the point and accurate and wants to know absolute answers to every question it poses well and the other thing is it asserts its dominance and it does it early i mean right after they connect it you know they pull the link and the computer demands to know why sure why are you disconnecting me and they actually humor it they turn around forbin at least turns around and says to the president i'm gonna go ahead and answer it so long as that's all right with you and the president goes well i guess we should probably do that because the computer wants to know hey hold on over here pay attention to me why are you shutting off my I'm I'm talking to my pen pal over here. Don't fuck with that. And they humor it. They don't have to. It's a fucking machine. They don't need to go back and answer it. If your computer starts having pop-up windows that say, are you sure you want to install this? Are you doing this over here? Hey, where'd you go? I'm going to log off in five minutes. Yeah. You don't have to do anything to it. It's a fucking machine. But they answer the computer just because the computer's there and asking mm-hmm. questions and they're you know, happy about their new technology they got up and running. It's, uh, it's a little bit amusing to them still. You know, Forbin's still smirking every time the computer does something correctly right. because he's proud. He marvels at this thing he's sure. going to create. And so the computer turns on them and they demand to know what its retaliation is. Mm-hmm. As soon as the computer threatens them, as soon as Colossus says, you know, do it or else, they say, we're your masters. We demand to know what the or else is. What are you threatening us with? Right. And the computer doesn't humor them because the computer doesn't give a shit. It doesn't have a sly grin because it's now asserting its dominance over the people. It's just, uh, it's furthering that dominance. It can't be bothered. It's not even like it's busy. It's a fucking computer. But it just chooses not to respond to them because it's the master in this situation now. So let's go back to Skynet for a second. Okay. Now, when we talked about the Terminator films, and anytime we talk about these technology films, the, um, the idea is that technology is getting way too out of hand and soon the computers are gonna take over. I don't feel like, despite our conversation thus far, that's even remotely where Colossus is going. No, it's not. I don't not. think it cares about that at all. No, that's not what the, the film is about Colossus. It's not about technology. It's not about computers replacing people. What it ends up being about is computers taking over mm-hmm. people. You know, just new leadership. Pl- new planetary leadership is the end goal right. of Colossus. But it's not cars coming to life and killing people like you pointed out. It's not your blender tying you up in the kitchen sure it's just colossus and guardian which barely even exists colossus devours guardian sure Pac-Man they just become style. one unit right and exactly and that unit is brought about not by man just trying to further technology this isn't a parable about technology and how we need to be cautious it's about the cold war mm-hmm. so a brief um a brief note because we don't expect everybody to know history do we have our dates on the Cold War straight here? You I'm, think we can do this? Yeah. So we're just as awful at history. No, strike that. We're even more awful at history than probably everyone who's downloaded this. But so we're all on the same page. Cold War actually didn't officially end until, you know, after the first President Bush announced its end. Right, in 91. And so, you know, the actual announcement, well, I guess to go back, we have 1987, mm-hmm. which uh, Reagan, you know, that's the tear down this wall speech. Right. Still did not end the war. No, still didn't end the war. In 1989, there was the Bush announcement that mm-hmm. we ended the war at the Malta summit. Did not end the war. Still didn't actually end the war. So most people don't consider the war to be completely over until the USSR disbanded in 1991. That's the end of the war. I guess that's even after the point where we're then collaborating with them. They're becoming our allies in the Gulf War against Iraq. So the Cold War is it's kind of ambiguous because it lasted for a real fucking right. long time. And uh, and not being a, a simple, narrow conflict and also being something recent, it's really ambiguous to, to still look back 
without so much history between us to say exactly what each part of the event was. Mm -hmm. Although you can find some pretty goddamn good write-ups of it. We just happen to be completely ignorant of our own history. We're really sorry about that. So 1991, for all intents and purposes. So these themes of the nuclear era, of Mm -hmm. the uh, the post-50s idea of Cold War, and we have the bomb now, and... uh, you know, well after World War II, there's still that lingering feeling. Now we know the, the worst of humanity. Sure. We know what's out there. And that's the fear that this is actually playing with. Absolutely. Not so much that our computers are going to become so advanced, which ends up being the mechanism here, uh-huh. but the uh, playing on the, the hair trigger fear. Mm-hmm. And I like that because normally when you talk about Cold War fears, you end up getting to a point where you're discussing mutually assured destruction. The idea that if we have the bomb and Russia has the bomb, then neither one of us is going to send it over first because then the other one will retaliate and we're both guaranteed losses. losses. Exactly. And so mutually assured destruction is kind of a way of saying, all right, don't worry about the bomb too much because we all know that we would destroy each other and nobody wants that. Uh-huh. But what this hair trigger fear refers to is that we've made it so easy to set the bomb off that while no you know, educated, sober person would intentionally do that, Mm -hmm. we're talking about an educated, sober person. Right. Human beings, as this movie also points out, a pause for the fucking movie again, um, we're emotional creatures. Yes. And while in the movie, it's not really one of us that decides we're pissed at the other country, although they do linger on that a bit when the first oil place in... Sure. uh, Well, once in after the first attack, when mm -hmm. Russia gets... Russia gets bombed and we manage to avoid being bombed. Right. And that's when there's kind of a weird turbulence between... Awkward. Right, exactly. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to break Russia your Russia basically goes, uh, we have to go for a bit. We'll, uh, we'll come back when we figure out what we're doing. Yeah, it's, it's when... You don't know if we're mad at you or not. You have an awkward moment with uh, you know, a friend. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just talk to you later. Yeah, right, right. You need to figure out what the fuck is going yeah. on there. <laughs> and so it does kind of remind us, and you know, even when we get to the ultimate, what they think is going to be the solution. Human beings are emotional. We have emotional needs, and we are not uh, completely impervious to one of us just getting pissed off. But that's not even what this hair trigger fear is so much about. It's more in this case about, you know, here we've set up one of many possible scenarios where if we're going to leave bombs pointed at one another, we better hope that somebody who, you know, isn't in charge doesn't get a hold of this. Mm -hmm. We better hope we don't actually make an enemy over there that later comes into power. We better hope that someone doesn't get, I use the term sober over and over, but that was a big fear too. And maybe not a fair one, but that some drunken Russian president would just go (laughs) hitting the button, right? Yep. And so now we have a situation, another hypothetical, we've put computers in charge. What if one of the computers has a malfunction, has a bug, gets a goddamn virus, or I don't know, become self-aware. Right. And so now we already have the nukes planted at each other. They're already sitting there. What if the computer detonates one itself? What if the computer uh, decides to send one at another country for whatever reason? Obviously, we're in sci-fi territory, so it's the computer becoming self-aware. Right. But it doesn't have to be that. The computer can malfunction. So I think this is a far more legitimate fear than simply one of the leaders decided to do it. The, the thing that mutual sure. assured destruction kind of, uh, kind of helps alleviate. There's one more thing that this movie does. If it wasn't already the greatest goddamn movie of all time, it does one other thing that is just fucking brilliant. Uh, Maybe two other things. I love that the ultimate answer, the plan they come up with is fucking. Yeah. Fucking will save the world. That's a big deal. They're going to go ahead and screw. They tell the, uh, they're like, hey, robot, we're going to have to go ahead and screw uh, probably about four times a week. And uh, we don't want you to watch. And the computer says, you know what? Ball movements. I'm going to have to watch that. Sleeping, definitely want to see that. Uh, copulation, oh, okay, I'll, I'll leave you alone. Four times a week, totally reasonable. Yep. The fucking computer says, totally reasonable. And so that's their plan. They're going to screw to save the world, which is amazing. Also fails, turns out. Yeah, also fails, which is the best part. Um, that's hard to even say because there's so many great Hell parts. Hell of a way to go. But maybe the best part, right? Maybe the best part. And so they start fucking, and the movie has a little bit of a lighter tone. Mm-hmm. We're starting to think, oh, now it's a fun spy movie. Sure, from it seems the kind 70s. of like James Bond. You have yeah. this attractive scientist who's getting all of his intrigue and inside information from his his mistress. Well, we were joking as we watched it. He was talking about all oh, the fourth rules that we have to undress out here, uh-huh. and I'm thinking he might have just invented that rule to make sure that they actually undress. And so things have a lot lighter tone, but then not so much. They totally fail. 
And the movie ends at a point where the computer says, you know, I'm aware of the betrayal that's been going on. Mm -hmm. And Forbin starts looking around. He's a little nervous. He actually just, he looks like he's been caught. He's a little embarrassed at this point and, and grieving, burdened. Sure. And the computer retaliates. And you're thinking, all right, what is the plan now? It turns out there's no plan. Yeah, well, it turns out the computer wins. The computer blows computer up California. Fucking wins. Computer blows up California. Forbin gets pissed off. Computer says, "Yo, Forbin, good news. I'm gonna let you go in a few weeks, and you're gonna love me for it. You're gonna fall in love with me, Forbin. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna be everyone's best friend." And Forbin defies it. It says never, as if that helps at all. If I'm gonna be enslaved, it won't be willingly. God damn it! And that's the best he can go out on. Yeah, that's it. the the only The only thing this film does to to kind of tell you that maybe huma- humanity has a fighting chance, which we clearly do not. No, not we at all. We have lost. No, we lose. Forbin says, I'll be your slave, but I ain't going to like it, you damn dirty computer. Yeah, and so this is another one of those great things, right? This is um, a- another unanswered question, much like the question in the beginning of the film, that's raised but never answered. The question of, we have Colossus here in the United States, in the USSR, They have Guardian, a nearly identical machine that has popped up out of nowhere. And so everyone is looking around at each other saying, wait, hold on. How the fuck? What is Guardian? How did that appear? Who leaked our technology? Do we have some kind of mole? It's a question that the movie addresses, certainly, but it doesn't answer the question. The urgency is so ramped up in, uh, you know, the the fast pace, how things are moving, especially fast paced for a movie where you, you spend most of it in one or two rooms. Mm-hmm. It seems unusually still a lot of tension, but still fast paced somehow. And so that question doesn't get answered. But the other question that doesn't get answered and is so awesome when you're rewatching the film to try and figure out is how does the computer know about their plan? That's the big turn at the end. That's the big reveal is, hey, the computer knows what you're up to. You're not actually pulling the wool over its eyes. And so when you rewatch it, you're attempting to figure out all right, so at what point is the computer onto them? You know, does the computer figure it out? Maybe it doesn't turn itself off when the two of them go in the room. You know, those secret talks where they think they have privacy. Or maybe it's even before that. Maybe it's the general's exposition that yeah. the computer hears. Or, uh, you know, maybe it's even that first meeting they have outside when they hatch that plan. That's possibly the most scary option because there doesn't appear to be any surveillance equipment outside. And so that also leads you to believe, you know, maybe somebody in the group realized how futile their efforts were and decided to side with the machine, you know, to become the, the traitor of humanity and to give, uh, give away their secrets to Colossus. You know, maybe somebody standing in that group thinking, oh, fuck this. There's no way we're going to win. Maybe if I tell the machine what's going on, maybe if I side with it, when it enslaves humanity, maybe it won't enslave me quite as hard. Yeah, because that's definitely a point in the movie where it's starting to look like, all right, we're, I mean, it, just the fact that their plan is, uh, we'll pretend that she's my mistress. I mean, that's all they got at that point. It's starting to look really bleak already. Mm-hmm. And so I don't think it's completely insane to say that there might have been a traitor. Somebody might have said, uh, I'm looking out for my own interests. But of course, this is speculation. The movie doesn't do a lot to suggest that that's the case. It's just possible that that is the case. And that's uh, something great that having these open-ended, or I guess these uh, unanswered questions really allows you to do, is to speculate, is to put yourself in the world of the film and try and figure these things out. So aside from just having a great script that's, you know, kind of high IQ and talks about these mathematical principles and what have you, it also has unanswered questions that allow you to think about the movie after the movie's over. Or to, uh, to let you rewatch that movie and try and figure out, all right, at what point did the computer know? And that's something that's incredible, and I love to see that in movies, because it keeps you in the world of the film. It forces you to kind of put yourself in there and attempt to figure these things out. It just makes that a lot more fun. When you're rewatching this, you know how the movie ends. You now have a countdown clock to figure out the answer to these questions. Because once you get there, there's no more thinking about at what point did the computer know. Because you can only think about how completely fucked you are. It's so good and how abruptly it happens. Because the movie just says, up, you lose. Bye. Credits. You know, no fucking hope. Credits, bleak, no hope. For those of you still looking for hope, you can maybe find it on doublefeatureshow.com. You can go find one of our happier shows like what? Uh, Martyrs and Amelie's. No, don't listen to that one. I can't even go back. and Even (laughs) editing that show was hard for me. You don't understand. 
Well, then maybe send us some happy... You know what you can do? You can donate at donate.doublefeatureshow.com and tell us... Tell us a bunch of movies that you want us to... That'll make you feel better about the end of the world or the beginning of the world or I don't even give a shit. You can send us a bunch of movies and we'll pick two of them. We'll pick two people and one movie from each and that'll become a double feature. Also, every dollar you spend helps us defeat the machine. By buying more machines. <laughs> that's Yeah, that's actually not true. It's just we're going to put more machines in our studio. That's what we'll do. We'll get the machines off the street yeah. and take them off the network, off the grid, and just put them in the studio. Every dollar you spend brings a machine off the street. And into our clutches. Uh, also, something about going in the intro. People know about that, right? Uh-huh. Uh, the people who do the subscription donations will become super rock stars, and they're going to go in the theme of that end of the year episode. So, of course, as always, there's two more movies next time. This is a double feature we've been waiting, what, three years for? Yeah. This is a long goddamn time. Oh, yeah. Next time we're going to do some uh, female empowerment, I guess. Mm -hmm. A horror female empowerment thing. We're going to do May and Teeth. Yeah, finally. Get some Lucky McKee. Going to get some uh, Vagina Dentata. Really, what else could you ask for? Watch more fucking film. Bye.